your friends have always talked behind your back, wondering when you were going to get married, if you were going to get married. You've been together for 19 years. <laughs> Chances are you can probably stick it out for another 19 years. You can't date too long before you get married because then you really, you know, you'll discover how much of pain in the ass each other is. The commitment of the marriage sometimes pulls people apart for what reason, I don't know. But I, if you've been at it this long and it's working, then why get married? Just say you get pregnant or whatever. Yeah. You know, it just makes it more easier. You just feel more secure, I think, when you're married. What prevents you from getting married? Absolutely, why not? Are you loyal to each other? You don't see other people. So you may why, what, what have you got against marriage? Is that why you're doing the documentary? Because yeah, because you guys are together so long yeah. without being married. And you're trying to decide whether to get married or not. That's exactly it. Uh, that's well, a good way to so do smart. it. so smart, you see that? Yeah. That's why I married him. That you've had it go successfully for 18 years, for me to think that, that I know anything, you know, that you could do better, I, I think would be ridiculous. However, I'll, 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 I'll give a step. something blue, something barred, something old, and something new. And the ring is blue and barred. Um, her earrings are old, Her and her dress and her veil are new. This is the only, um, this is the only stuff I have for Ken, so. Boys are taught certain things by what gets marketed to them. Um, girls are taught certain things by what gets marketed to them. Boys don't get wedding toys, girls do. I hesitate to speak for all men on many issues but I think I can on this one that we really just don't plan weddings. I can remember as a child you put the towel on your head and you wrap it on and you walk down the aisle and you have a good time and it was you know so we did that I think most young girls um, I think do that. Not for me I feel like somehow I managed to grow up and avoid all those fantasies of being the princess bride and I used to work in a bridal shop and I um, sold dresses, and so I kind of got a lot of, like, some of the behind the scenes of um, when women are going through the process of the typical wedding, I guess. One time there was this girl in with one of the seamstresses, and she's like, she, like, she looked gorgeous, obviously. I mean, not many people look bad in wedding dresses, but, and she was just, like, crying to the seamstress. She's like... I just don't feel skinny in this. Well, 80% of wedding gowns are made outside the United States under less than desirable labor conditions. They'll also sell you a dress that's at least two sizes too big for you, so that when it comes in, you'll pay an additional $250 to have it tailored. And they'll sell you the, the accessories. So the average gown's about $1,000. Add to that about $250 to have it altered, and add to that another $200 for the, for the veil. So there are various practices involved just with the gown that we don't look at, we don't want to know about because it's our special day. And that's the message that gets sold. I think we live in a culture that absolutely tells all of us, men and women, marriage is the only natural state that we can or should live in. I think that to make any argument that it is a natural state. I think it goes against everything that we know um, in terms of anthropology. There's so many 
state that human beings live in. At the same time, I think we impose this sort of strange idea on young men that their job is to run away and not be caught. I grew up on a construction site all my summers as a kid. I mean, it, it, construction workers have their own language, their own coffee break discussions, their own lunch break discussions about, you know, oh, my old lady, they'd call their wife, and they'd always look at me as, you know, you know, this, my, my, my father's boy, the son on the construction site, you're so lucky, you're single, you got the whole life ahead of you, as if I was going out clubbing on the weekends and bringing home different girls every week or whatever. So I portrayed marriage as not the greatest thing in the world, as almost this, this boring life that these men always complained about. Um, and a beautiful realtor would go by and they're all whistling and it's a stereotype, but it happens. And um, I'm like, geez, you know, maybe marriage gets stale eventually. You, you do find this, this young lady and you, you have fun and you, and you go out and you party and you drink. And you, but, but once the kids come and once the burden of bills come and everything else, that's the complaining that I heard. So I, I thought I was in great shape. I'm single, I'm working. Um, everybody's praising me that I'm, I, you know, I'm so lucky. So marriage really wasn't around the corner for me at all. In many ways, women are targets of more of the pressure to get married. You know, sort of the, the old maid thing and a lot of the um, misrepresented research that's like, well, if you don't get married by 30, then, you know, forget it, like that whole thing. Where men, there's still kind of that image in culture that, you know, it's kind of cool for men to be unmarried, which leads to the stereotype that men don't want to get married and women do. But when it comes down to, like, who's being pressured and who has to really think through this issue about what they want as opposed to what the culture wants. It's women who are doing that work. It seemed like more the female thing, the female male thing was an action, I thought. I mean, just from having heard stories from my friends and so forth. Mm -hmm. It's like, I wanted to know where this was going kind of thing. So. Uh, listen, you're the one who just finished telling us that you were against the idea of marriage and so forth. <laughs> um, <laughs> When well, that's true, isn't pretty it? soon you meet um, someone in like but five I months later, you want to get married. Say so that I've cheap. also been sufficiently influenced by the mythologies to have sort of, you know, cultural stereotypical kind of ideas that there's one person for you and marriage is a good thing, that kind of thing. I didn't ex exempt myself from that entirely. You know, I think Adele was, I think it's, it's pretty clear that she was kind of the reluctant bride, if you will, and uh, I kind of saw the whole thing ahead of time and believed that I was going to convince her, but I remember when she called me from California to tell me that, that she was pregnant, and uh, I was I was ecstatic. I was just overjoyed. <laughs> I just said, well, that's great. Now we can be a family, you know? That was what I told her. I said, this is perfect. I've got her now, I kind of said to myself. You know, she's got to marry me now. In one of my stories, the, the, the guy... Uh, the narrator is he's he's at this hotel for this wedding and he feels what he says is the grooved tracks of nauseating similarities between him and every other couple in this hotel and i think there is that feeling of falling into step with other people you know um i think it's it's kind of corny that um we succumb so easily or maybe it's just my problem but I mean, I think people want to be individuals. I remember watching like one couple after another get married and sort of see how goofy they were acting for the few months before and the few months after because they knew they were the couple of the moment. They were the ones who everybody was looking at to see how they behaved or whatever. And the further they get away from the wedding date, the better off they are, I think. The actual wedding ceremony itself, the sort of ideal, the white wedding ideal, is built on a royal ideal um, and built on a spectacle of accumulations, one that shows great extravagance in its display um, and also at the same time signals to all who watch and all who participate the great promise this couple holds for accumulating even more property and power. So it's very much a symbolic site for acting out um, upper-class interests. And in how the middle class tries to emulate 
the upper classes. Um, in emulating the upper classes, they actually legitimize the upper classes' holdings of excessive property. A couple weeks before the before the wedding, I was having crying jags and stuff like that because I was just so stressed out because I was spending so much time on things that really didn't matter. It had nothing to do with why we were getting married. But this is crazy. I looked at my mother's list and I'm looking at relatives and friends and I'm like, Mom, I don't even know this person, but you have to invite her. She's an old Greek fa you know, family, friend of the family. You know those Greeks, and I'm very proud to be Greek, but you know those Greeks. If you don't invite her, she'll never talk to you again. Mom, I don't talk to her now. I mean, it's, you know, it's... So I, I got quite involved when I came to guest list. But look, when 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 uh, when a male uh, enters uh, this uh, sort of process, uh, uh, you're, you're out of your mind basically, and uh, I, I can't give you any any details. Everything 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 becomes kind of a vague and unreal and so on, you know. And then by the time you by the time you come down to earth again, it's too late. The ring by the time. We, we went and we bought the rings. I'd never worn rings before, and I'd never worn any sort of jewelry, and so that was kind of weird for me. And, you know, I felt like, I don't know, it felt like this sort of bizarre kind of, oh, now I'm a husband, what the hell is that? And, you know, the ring was kind of the symbol of that I was wearing all the time. Not only that, but I'd lost so much weight by then that, because, uh, you know, I'm from the diabetes, that it didn't fit. <laughs> so it would just jangle around in my finger all the time, you know, and it was like to make me even more conscious of it. And so there was that. There was all sorts of other things. But you can talk about your weirdness. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Everything about it felt weird. It was like we were suddenly, you know, it wasn't us anymore. And it was pod sort people. Of, yeah, pod people. <laughs> It seems like every time, you know, when people get married, they too often fall into the pattern of giving up those things that made them unique or attractive to the other person. Uh, and so, you know, that independence is lost. That, that would be, um, I think, one of the biggest things that I see people lose when they get married. Well, I think, I mean, we're, I think we're dealing with sort of the heart of the issue here, which is, you know, people losing themselves in something larger, the, some societal thing which is big and kind of takes you away from yourself, or you feel that way anyway. I don't think anybody enjoys that. But I think the first time a man is asked to take the, the um, flipper for the barbecue and walk over there and watch the burgers, you, you start to feel this strange wiring, you know, and all of a sudden it gets to be very serious business or you feel your father and your grandfather standing there around you, their ghosts are saying, you know, you're cooking it too much, you know, and you, you have to do this to make sure you don't, it doesn't stick. You know what things you need to do to keep yourself, your identity together or whatever, or, or to keep yourself at peace or in balance, and you don't do those things anymore. And instead, you just, you know, you sit down at the dinner table with a can of something and you say what happened to you today and all of a sudden you find you're in some script and curry was incredible gave us a <laughs> lot of time spoke with us wonderful person al roca chatted with us they treat they treated us well we felt we felt like guests you know what i mean like i felt like sting you know do you see how katie Couric is touching me with yeah. both hands i like that <laughs> Both hand action. First, it was the Today Show producers called each of us separately. They spoke with Elaine and interviewed her over the phone. And then they called me and asked me kind of the same questions to verify that, you know, we weren't running a scam, that we were really married. Um, yeah, yeah, about to be married. Uh, yep, yeah, good. Um, and uh, they asked if I'd ever pose nude. You know, I thought that was funny. I said, when you'll see me, you'll know the answer to that one. Um, but this is right after How to Marry a Millionaire? Who wants to marry a millionaire? Yeah. And yeah. that whole scandal broke, so I think they were a little more interested in our background than yeah. normal. Yeah, full credit check. Uh, I was surprised, uh, criminal background check. It was, it was awesome. We came home one night, 
And the Today Show producer was on the phone. Elaine picked up the phone. And um, I just heard Elaine screaming, saying, we evidently, what did they just say? You're the final, you made the final four. You're going to be on national the television. Day, the day before they selected the final four couples, the producer called. And she said, OK, this is it. You guys made it. Congratulations. Like I said, they pay for your whole um, mm -hmm. wedding and Honeymoon. Wedding and honeymoon. Wedding and honeymoon. Wedding and honeymoon. They uh, paid for the whole the whole thing. The bridal parties, dresses, the um, bridegroom's tux, or the rental of the tux. They fly in 20 guests, but of course you're free to invite as many more. Hotel accommodations. Right, for yeah. the guests too. Then immediately after the ceremony, they were having a brunch at one of the hotels, I guess, there in New York. Did they pay for the bachelor party too? No, I don't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the honeymoon. But the thing is, you had to give up complete control over everything. You couldn't even select your honeymoon destination. You couldn't determine how you'd wear your hair, right. what tuxedo I would wear, uh, the, the wedding bands. And that, I kind of, I don't know. You, you kind of, uh, you know, the public determines your, your wedding band, and that, that bothered me to a certain extent. Right. Every week, they'll uh, focus on a particular part of the planning and then the whole audience, internet voting, will choose between four choices. And like Sean was saying, I believe the first one featured the wedding bands, you know. And I was worried one. about hackers, like all my enemies, you know, purposely going on and ordering oh. the ugliest <laughs> tuxedos and the ugliest rings and stuff. You, know, you don't know these people picking your wedding accessories. You know, they could be dorks. Mm -hmm. Strangers would come up and say, I voted for you. So many people were calling friends that I hadn't seen since the right. third grade. Uh, eighth grade, you know, people calling up saying, "Man, you hey you know. I mean, it was, I mean, it, it, it was ridiculous. I'm like, "Yeah, well, it's 20 years later. I'm supposed to age." The phone right. would not stop ringing. It rang constantly. It rang constantly, and at that time, we didn't have call waiting, so the people would get a busy signal, and they'd keep calling. So as soon as you hung up the phone, it would ring, and I've been calling you since for the past two hours, you know. <laughs> And they want your attention. Everyone wanted to hear the whole story. And you had to give it to them. Most of the middle class, intellectual middle class in Argentina, is that's the right thing to do. You do therapy to find out who you are. And um, if you don't, it's because you have a problem. <laughs> so. So I did it. I, I, I did a lot of um, searching, and, and, and suddenly I was decided and ready to really find someone that would really be the, the person, the right person. He gave me this plastic ring with the candy on the top. It was like peach flavored. And in fact, a year and three months later, it's still half eaten in my refrigerator, and it's completely goopy. It's really very, very disgusting, <laughs> um, but it's still there. Anyway, so, he, and the first thing that we did, like, he gave me that ring, and it was just like, well, I got you this ring. <laughs> you know, it was, it was like so unlike a proposal, and I was so relieved that I just kind of re reacted in the weird intellectual way that I normally would, which is, I went to the OED, the, the, what is it, Old English Dictionary, and I looked up the word wife, you know, and that was like, what, in hindsight, I think, like, what was I thinking, you know, because, okay, cynical as I may be, or feminist as I may be, or not interested in, like, the first response to, is to run to a dictionary it seems a little bit crazy to me. Um, but anyway, we looked up wife, you know, and it was like, ale wife and fish life, and I don't know, I mean, it, I didn't like wife so much. I think I was I was very used to being chosen, um, very passive in in the choice of a partner. Uh, so partner after I mean boyfriend after boyfriend I I could I I saw this pattern going on with me uh, that I would fall in love with the guy who fell in love with me first. And as a matter of fact, I wasn't falling in love with the guy. I was falling in love with his love for me. 
it really highlighted to me some of what I objected to in traditional marriage and everything leading up to it and so on and so forth, which is how passive you are. You know, the man decides he wants to ask, and then he asks, and then you say yes or no. I mean, it's not a big assertion of self there. Obviously, the, the relationship couldn't last because uh, you have to fall in love with the person for who the person is, not what, for what the person feels about you. And um, I, think, I think in that sense, it could apply to so many women who can be, ten, I mean, have the tendency, we have the tendency to be more passive. That's how, how society sometimes um, tells us to be. My therapist said, well, um, you just don't want to let yourself be happy. You know, okay, so it's a lot of pressure coming from a lot of sides telling you um, that the reason you don't want to get married is some kind of pathology. I started talking to all my friends, even my, my private students that I was tutoring in Spanish, and I told them, listen, I'm ready to find someone if you know of anybody who can, um, who can be um, a right match for me, please uh, think about it and maybe you can introduce us. Nothing happened and then I, I saw it. I, I said, okay, this is not, this is again, you're doing it again. You're expecting that somebody else will, will make that decision for you. Somebody else will, will choose you again. And uh, I had to do it on my own. I, for the first time, I had to do it on my own. Certainly we are aware that, at, that my um, putting it off is unusual in women. I mean, we don't know too many women who are saying, like, let's just wait, or let's just wait and see. And being the person in that situation is sort of interesting, because if a man was doing what I was doing, er all the girlfriends would be saying to the, you know, to the woman, like, come on, get, get rid of him. You know, what's the matter with, with you? He's never going to commit. So, I started going to this um, interesting single talks given by whoever, <laughs> but nothing happened. No men, nobody, nobody approached me. Eventually, some women will get to talk and have some laughs, and <laughs> you know, but n not one man approached me um, in any of those. Um, talks or gatherings or even cocktail parties or <laughs> you name it. <laughs> so one of those days I saw this flyer um, with an internet address called www.jdate.com. I said to my office, I thought I was being discreet, I have a great idea, it will make us a lot of money, we'll do a wedding issue, you know. I, mean, I wanted to call it a I, something like feminist alternatives or alternative Jewish weddings, and a lot of my objections had to do with Judaism and its understanding of what a Jewish marriage was also. I also did not like um, any of the ritualistic stuff. I mean, I couldn't understand, like, I can't, I still can't understand, like, every woman wants this thing, right? You put on a white dress and you look like every other woman. And you get your diamond, and your hand looks like every other woman's hand, you know? And it's like, I, at the turn of the millennium, like, why, <laughs> why are we doing that? So I made all my choices, and I, I clicked <laughs> all those uh, little boxes to click, and then suddenly more than 200 profiles showed up. I liked only, only, absolutely one profile, and that was my husband, <laughs> my <laughs> now husband, Howard. It was reprinted on Jewish World Review. Well, I got all this mail. I start reading it out loud, you know, and the first one is like, it's a good thing you found out, Daniel, it's a good thing you found out about this woman now. You should get rid of the lady and find someone who deserves you. They went on and on and on. And some of them were like, you know, marriage is made by God. And who, who are you to say that, you know, it's oppressing you and 
all that this piece said were the things that I described, you know, that I had feminist objections to a wedding. And you cannot believe how angry people were at me, and personally angry. By then, every time I would go to my friend ha friend's houses with, uh, who had internet, uh, they, I would go and say, let me introduce you to Howard. And everybody knew Howard. We saw the pictures. Everybody read his profile. Every, all my friends knew him. All my friends knew him because all, those, all that time, I would still be thinking about him because that was the only guy I liked. So, so well, I said, well, uh, give yourself one more chance. And if it doesn't work, then you get you erase your name from that list, and that's it. And um, I contacted him. I decided to, for the first time in my life, to contact a guy and and take the initiative. I said, okay, I'm going to listen to my instincts for the first time in my life. But I did get to this one that was just awful, and it said. Um, it started out with like some random insults and then ended up saying that I was going to have children, but I would never like debase myself by taking care of them. When they grew up, they would work out their issues without me, um, but they would have issues and they would hate me. He actually used the word hate in there, which was really surprising. And on the internet, when you meet somebody, it's like, it's a, this like a, a little, process, you know, like, okay, you first send messages back and forth, and then you dare to give the person your phone number, so you start communicating over the phone, and then finally you meet. But what I did was more the Argentine way, if you wish. I went right, <laughs> right for it, you know, I said, okay, let's have a cup of coffee. And I just kept looking at it, and I mean, then then my eyes did tear up. I mean, I could not. I, you know, it. I just was really misunderstood. <laughs> I wanted something that would go smoothly. That would, you know, it's like, yes, we are together. We'll be together the rest of our life, and that's perfect. <laughs> That's perfect, and that's the way it's going to be. That, so I was looking for that. <laughs> I was looking for it too, a lot, actually, and I found it. <laughs> Marriage is one of those things. Marriage is one of those things that's highly controlled. Um, everything from religion's involvement in it, to the ritual practices, to the license with the state. Um, well, to me, religious, religious marriage transcends any of the laws that society has for marriage. It's indissoluble. God defines what marriage is. Genesis chapter 3 says that the man will leave the mother and father and will cling on to the woman, and the two will become one. And that is the definition of marriage, and we have no right to redefine what marriage is. We joked about it because you have to take this personality test, and it's like, you know, you fill in with the number two pencil, the circles, and we did it. And we, Father Mike, who married us, reviewed the results with us, and he basically told us that he didn't, according to the results, we didn't have a lot of hope for our marriage. <laughs> who is this rabbi? I mean, I don't go to synagogue. Daniel doesn't go to synagogue. You know, we have our holidays or whatever, but, you know, who is this man who I've never met? going to come in here and say, you two are so special and you're so right for each other. You know, it's like you've heard them at funerals, too. They go, what a wonderful person <laughs> this person was. We've never met them. When we got married the second time, we elected to have a ketubah. Max wrote it up for us. And it was an old-fashioned, it was an old-fashioned ketubah. And I can assure you that those are not particularly words by which I live, but they are words <laughs> that um, that have that have some history, and I wanted that history as part of as part of the ceremony. We would like to have um, a ceremony where we can invite our family and our friends, and if it can be um, in the church, we'd like that. If we get to a point where they accept that, uh, at this point, we're just 
thinking about the day when that happens, when we're able to do that. Um, but we're looking to have an official ceremony where there's a pastor or a minister. Which and we Methodist if they vote in May to allow that. <laughs> so we're waiting on that too, to see how the Methodist Church votes on allowing um, the holy matrimony between two men. This is holy matrimony according to you perverts. What do you think? He's going to get uh, impregnated up his colon? Behold the sodomite honeymoon. So it's a bunch of, you know, right-wing zealots get so upset about the word marriage, let them, you know, just give me my rights, you know, and don't, you know, and don't screw around with other people's rights. The Alternatives to Marriage Project is a national organization for unmarried people. We have chosen not to get married, um, and it was our experiences finding out how difficult it is to, to live as an unmarried couple long-term in this society that finally drove us to start this organization a couple of years ago. A significant portion of the people who contact us are gay, lesbian, or bisexual and are trying to sort out um, the whole move to, to legalize same-sex marriage and at the same time asking the question, is this really what we want? Is this really the right direction for us to be moving in? If we have these happy, thriving families that seem to be working so well in, in kind of more creative ways, and maybe that's a power that we have, a benefit in this community. By not having marriage, we've been forced to make more conscious decisions that maybe work better for us. We are here between the Washington Monument and the Lincoln Memorial, standing in strong tradition, saying to our government that we are full citizens of this country. I came here in 71 on a trip on a tourist visa. At the time, gay people were not allowed to even enter the country. If they'd been naturalized as citizens, they'd be stripped of naturalization and kicked out of the country. And I met Richard, and we fell in love. Uh, it was on the 5th of May, Cinco de Mayo, and that's 29 years ago. Uh, I, came, I went on to England, and a short time, a few months back uh, later, I came back to be with Richard. That was the sole reason I came back to the United States, to be with Richard. Um, well, we realized after a certain length of time that it was going to become obvious that I was undocumented. So we took steps to alleviate that. And one of the steps was eventually that Richard and I got married legally in Boulder, Colorado. And he petitioned the Immigration and Naturalization Service to grant me residence, a residence as the spouse of a US citizen. Uh, the Immigration Department ruled, and this is their words, that you have failed to establish that a bona fide marital relationship can exist between two faggots. Close quote. Right now, as couples, we are human beings without legal rights in 49 states. But we only have 49 more to go. from the east and the west, from the north and the south, we will enjoy parental rights, job security, equal housing opportunity, insurance benefits for our families, hospital visitation rights, adoption rights, inheritance rights, breaks and the right to marry the person we love. When I met Philip, I knew this was Mr. Right for me. Uh, I don't want him to be sick in the hospital and not be told uh, that I can't go in and visit him because he's, uh, you know, if he was on a respirator or something like that. We should never be told we're not there because, quote, we're not a relative. And it's one piece of paper that makes us a relative called a wedding license, and we want it, that wedding certificate. I understand the, the struggle for gays and lesbians to want to feel that they are uh, not disenfranchised. They want to be part of mainstream culture. But I think the real issue here is that mainstream culture needs to account for the ways it discriminates against the masses by creating a structure that's counterproductive to what we're supposed to be about. For as much as each of these couples have declared their love, one for the other,
and have given tokens of their covenant each to the other and have done this willingness before their friends gathered here as well as before the larger American community, I proclaim together our rights as couples in hopes that the day will come when not only will our own community recognize our relationships, but the law of this country also. What you're essentially doing is shoring up that structure um, that's excluded you so that you can participate while others are still excluded. It's, I think one of the ways that the debate gets skewed is that we have this perception that there are heterosexuals who are married and there are gays who want to get married. And if they all get married, that takes care of all of us. But that assumes that that's all who's, who's here. And that's not the case. It is the case that we have a, a varied population, a very diverse population, with very diverse social practices, and not everybody participates regardless of their sexuality. I'm glad that we're together. The married yeah. part of it, you know, I don't know about that. And yeah, I don't either. There have actually been times when, and this is, this is kind of silly, but th there have actually been times when we've talked about not being married, staying together, but not being married, which, of course, would require us to get a divorce. Mm -hmm. Just because, you know, we have so many problems with the institution of marriage. And, you know, for me, I'm bisexual, so, um, you know, I can see the problems. I mean, you know, if I were in a relationship with a woman instead of with Pat, I couldn't get married if I wanted to. Finally, when Carl was seven days old, we went down to the Justice of the Peace and got married. It was well, actually, it was not a Justice of the Peace, it was a judge. Yeah, it was a judge. And he, w he gave us a little lecture about how, you know, Maybe we didn't do it in the same order as a lot of people did, but, but by golly, he believed in the institution of marriage, and he was glad that we were going to get married and, and, you know, so on and so forth. Since we were both active duty, they would not move me or him to one she of the other duty stations. She was at Fort Benjamin Harrison in Indiana. Until we had a marriage license to show <clears throat> that we had a social uh, bonding that required, you know, or allowed us to be living a legal, together. A legal. A legal. I mean. As a matter of yeah, fact, I really, I really... I resent that part about it. The yes and no part was the visa thing. We wouldn't have gotten married at the time that we did if it hadn't been for the visa ne necessity, because my visa was running out. I didn't have a uh, transfer to an H-1 to a work permit at the time, so. Actually, you had an H visa at the time. Oh, uh, no, I had an F visa at the time. I no, guess. you had an H visa at the time. What we've done is we've taken marriage this notion of, of a linking to the state, that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about whether you signed a marriage license. We're also talking about whether or not you did it in a church. I mean, some of that's in there, too. But we've taken this thing called marriage and said it is the only thing that counts as commitment. In New York State, for example, uh, just as a way to illustrate this, the domestic relations laws in New York State say Marriage is a relation between a man and woman and the state, and the state regards with a jealous eye any attempt to intervene in that relation. Well, you've just married the state. Oh, yeah, I was only 16. I got, in, I got engaged to get into the ring. He told me that he loved me very much and all, and he said he would like me to be his wife and a mother for his children. And he said he'll do the best he can to make me happy in my life with him. <laughs> I, I wore a veil. I had a veil and a white dress. And my sister Stella was my only bridesmaid. I only had one. I could have had more, but I didn't want to go through all that expense for my mother to provide all the food and, you know, make the wedding so expensive. There was no income then already. My brothers were on their own. They weren't married, but they were putting money away that they, they had girls and they thought, well, they wanted to get married. And that's why my father didn't let me go to college or to school up more. He figured that any time the boys would get married, he won't have no assistance. And my father said, you get a man, he'll support you. <laughs> There's a whole story in the book. <laughs> I did like house cleaning. I liked cooking. I liked almost everything that was done around the house, you know, and I just got involved. I'll have a dream house sometimes, I said. I hope to have a dream house. I didn't get a dream house, but I got a house. <laughs> we got along beautiful. I, we had a wonderful life. I can't complain. The only thing, three months after I was married, he got hurt bad. So 
So he was off work over almost a year. I was home. I couldn't I couldn't go to work. I didn't work after I was married. They wouldn't let me. My mother wouldn't and dad wouldn't let me work. No way. They said my place was to be home. Even your dad, I wanted to go to work before Edward was born. Your father said no. He said, stay home. That's why I cried so much, because I wanted to go to school. Instead of staying home, I'd go to school. And I thought, well, I'd be a school teacher or, or a nurse. I couldn't win. <laughs> I wasn't the boss. My dad was the boss. <laughs> so Matt Lau's walking around. He's going, now, are you ready? Are you ready, America, for the couple? And I swear he comes... And the winning couple is, and as he says that, you watch the tape, he's right behind me, and he touches my chair like this. So you'll see me kind of sit up like, oh, man, he goes, couple number one, and, and, and walks away. And I was just, I mean, we already decided we were going to clap and smile regardless. Right. So we did do that. But it was tough because it's on, I mean, it's on national TV, and I, I know my whole family is like, we have to write those checks. Now, you know, everybody was mad. But uh, Because we all had a feeling that the winning couple knew the day before that they won. They spent more time on her hair and makeup. They did all of us first, and then all of a sudden she was gone for 45 minutes. We were in and out in, what, five? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was just, come on. That but, was kind of uh, cool getting we my makeup still, done. We still... Still don't regret it at and, all. And how did he pick her up when they won, remember? It was like a Greta Garbo kind of rehearsed, like, oh, we won in the 360. And <laughs> I mean, it seemed so choreographed. Before we lost, we had these beautiful, uh, I think, Lincoln Navigator leather interior truck sunroof. I mean, you know, drivers picking us up. When we lost, it was kind of like, OK, Go out, go out that way. The subway is at the end of the block, and then we. But we actually asked someone. We had to say, please, we're, you know, could <laughs> we need to get to the airport? We need to get to the driver. airport. <laughs> we thought that we'd have a driver, but it just goes to show you that you gotta win. Losing is no fun. It was just kind of like, okay, don't let the door hit your ass on the way out. You know, <laughs> I had messages. Our vendors watched the show saw us lose. When we came back, I had messages thinking it's my friend saying, we saw it, you looked great, sorry you lost. They were, it was the photographer, okay. Uh, if you want to keep need, your date. Need, need that 240. Uh, I think that then the disc jockey, he, every, everyone was watching and just wait. So that was a little, that was a little depressing at first. All in all, it was it still turned out to be a wonderful wedding. Yeah, yeah. We went ahead and got married here in D.C. And then we had a wedding, which you well know. Which I didn't want. I, I had did. done the wedding thing before. But we had, you have to admit, we, we struck a pretty good balance. Yeah, it was okay. Except the whole veil thing didn't work. I was like, I wanted the blusher thing, and you're like, no way. the thing on the top of your head. So I didn't want a wedding gown. But there was a part of me that said this was Will's only wedding, and he has images, imagery that he wants to remember. And um, I didn't want to just stand in the way and say, well, I've done this before and I'm not doing right. it again. And, and she, and, and so I, the, I at begged. first, yeah, for the, the first conversation we had, she was like, I really don't want to do this. And I said, well, I don't want to, it doesn't have to be big, but let's have some kind of party with it. And she said, you're right, that's fine. And so we did. And it was, well, it, I think it felt part like of it is, is that you like pomp and circumstance. Yeah, I do. You know, he wants to do things in, in a very, um, 
What's the word I'm looking for? Pompous way almost. Not about in the grand. negative. <laughs> grand. <laughs> pompous. But you do like Thanks, pompous. Thanks, babe. <laughs> Kim and I getting married, we're very excited about it. But my folks are also very excited about it. And as we go to barbecues, the relatives are very excited. It's, it's, a, it's almost, it's a celebration. We're trying to downplay the whole thing. We're just throwing a big party and inviting 150, 160 close friends and relatives. now that Jay and I got engaged because of him. Um, because I know being his, being his own. I know we would have been very excited. Um, so we're gonna do, I don't know, probably something in the church. My brother's walking me down the aisle, which is good. And I actually asked my Uncle Freddie because he is my godfather and he's, he's been great and he's the only surviving brother too, which is kind of sad, but he's gonna say something sort of in place of my father. And I guess I just, cause it's hard, cause I want Jay to know, and I, he knows so much my mother loves him, but I want him to know that my father would just, you can't express it, but my father would just be so happy. You put the dress on <laughs> with the veil and your mother starts crying. <laughs> It actually made me feel pretty good. We didn't even do anything like fun or cool, you know? It's mm -hmm. just like, you know, she worked on Thursday. We found a dress at some store and then I we... kind of thought it was cool getting married on the court. But I it was... Do, I thought like, it was... not want to do like a big party or anything. No, but I mean, we didn't throw any imagination into it all, even for our, uh, ourselves. I don't mean we had to involve a lot of people. Did we have imagination? Did... Apparently we didn't, so... <laughs> We just displayed it once wonder. again, but we didn't give ourselves time to even, like, see if we had any. We just sort of, like, said, we got to get married this week. We can either get married this week or next week. And it's like, we didn't have to do that. We could have done something, like, fun and memorable rather than... No, no, not memorable. I'm sorry. I just have never, like, I've, in fact, not okay, wanted so a big you wedding. I never fun. wanted a traditional wedding. I never wanted a big deal made. You know what I mean? I think Did I like say incident. that I wanted a big I'm wedding or a traditional wedding? Incident. Did you hear me say that? You said something you wanted something memorable. You said you wanted something But that doesn't need mean I need three hundred people. Right. Sure. You just wanted something fun and cool perhaps. Okay. Yeah. All right, I'll buy that. Like right. I could have said that we decided to get married in some interesting <laughs> location like Montana. You know? And but we didn't. We got married in Geneva, Illinois, which is memorable because no, no, I do I'm remember it. I'm happy that we didn't go anywhere in particular. It wasn't Montana. It wasn't on horseback. It wasn't, you know, bungee jumping. Or I'm sorry, but I just never wanted a big deal for a wedding. Do you guys go on a honeymoon? No. <laughs> because we never wanted a big deal for a honeymoon, you see. We're really like so we, miss the we don't honeymoon we don't like any kind of right. fun or or any kind of you know interesting things at all because no, it was just that would really debase our intellectual view of weddings, which is that we just get it over with and then you know. No, I'll tell you what. <laughs> dominate all conversations about it. This is so funny. Even based on everything you said, you didn't want you know. I mean, marriage was not something you were prepared for, right? I mean, to me, well, this made it much concerned. better, didn't it? definitely don't think you need to. Yeah. I see, I see your own sense, the two of you, that you're even questioning whether you should do it. 
probably says that there's an inclination to do something more than just the living together that you're doing. So why don't you just make out the paper, give you three dollars, take a Wasserman test, and, and go. then you got it made. Oh, this is very old, corny advice, Fred. But when you get married, it's just, they say the secret of happy marriage is three little words. You were right, honey. I'd like to think that maybe we could come to be a good luck omen at a wedding, so everyone would invite us to their wedding. Because if you've got the Alternatives to Marriage Project people there, then you'll probably be okay. The, the very first thing is because of my experience is don't lie to yourself. Don't, don't lie to yourself. I mean, really listen to yourself. Whatever you feel, don't, don't hide it. It's really important once you make these objections and once people start attacking you for them that you not go like, this is my rigid position. Yeah, I'd say make it so that you enjoy it. In some ways, like, being married and at least, like, being with someone is very, like, helps me emotionally a, a lot. In some yeah, ways. and I think it helps me too. Yeah, definitely. It's sort of a solid thing because you That's have somebody true. there all the time. If it wasn't for me, you'd be psycho by now. I think you should. I, it's a wonderful, a wonderful contract. Thing to be. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. It's David. a wonderful agreement. I believe that you need to just protect yourselves, you know, and and it's a, it's almost like a business decision more than it is because you've already got a lot of the commitment and everything else done. So you make that other decision for yourself based on what what you need. When I see a vision uh, having to do with creating loving communities, it really is about um, all of those things that it would take to have a community actually work together and actually provide for each other and collaborate. It would mean going next door and saying to the woman next door, I'm going to the grocery store, can I get you anything? It goes beyond the level of just the symbolic into the everyday lived reality of what it means to be in a collaborative space having nothing to do with whether or not you're married. If, if you know that you're going to be committed to each other, there is no reason to get married if you don't want to. Um, but I think it's just important to remember how much it means to your parents um, and everybody else. My, my real answer to you guys not, you know, trying to be entertaining for a documentary film would be um, that uh, it doesn't matter what you do. Right before my grandfather died, I went to visit him. It was two weeks before. And I'm Jewish and I was worried. Laura's not Jewish. In fact, her uncles fought for the Nazis. Her mom's from Dresden. They had to fight. They were in the Wehrmacht. And I'm sitting there feeling kind of guilty that I'm not doing this thing, you know. I'm not forcing my fiancé to convert. I'm not suggesting it. I'm not looking for a Jewish woman. And I said something to my grandfather after she had just called and we were talking for a minute. And uh, when I held the phone, I said, but she's not Jewish. And, and he said, you see what you're doing? putting a division there where there isn't any. And he was not kidding around. And he, he, he just meant, you got two people. They want to do this thing. Don't try to throw something into the mix that doesn't belong there. So maybe you guys don't need that. Maybe you got married when you were 17. I don't know. And, you know, and this all seems redundant to you. Doesn't bother me. I figured it's not my life, it's your life and his life. I don't interfere in nobody's life. <laughs> Did you get it all? <laughs> Did you get it all word by word? <laughs> Thank you.
I-N-G. First comes love, then comes booty. <laughs>